So today we're going to focus on the reality that each one of us, our love has a legacy. A legacy that redounds not only in the years to come, but also into eternity. It's going to be either death or life. Because there are different kinds of love. Not all love is good, contrary to what the world tells us. Some years ago, quite a few years ago, Nancy and I were a relatively, we weren't newlyweds, but we'd only been married a few years, and we were in Orlando, and I was a co-teacher of a very large young adult Sunday school class, and this young adult Sunday school class with one of the other large classes from First Presbyterian Church of Orlando, the folks, some of the leaders had planned a marriage retreat. So this was for young couples, uh, young married couples, and it was led by, or the key speaker was a published author, a psychiatrist, a Christian psychiatrist and writer and speaker named Larry Crabb. And I'll have to go into some of the other things he talked about because remembering this reminded me some other things. That's another day, another sermon. But I remember one of the things that he said that was so striking, it was simple but jarring and deep, is Larry Crabb said, really there's two directions of marriage uh, and the love that's involved in a marriage. One direction, which he said is the most common of people, both actually Christians, unfortunately, as well as non-Christians is, it's a kind of a transaction situation where one or both parties are saying, I love you because you make me feel good about myself. I found the person who will make me feel good about myself. And so I love you because you complete me. And I love you because you give me things that I need right now. That he contrasted, Larry Crabb did, with a, a relationship in which one or both parties are saying, I love you for you, and I give myself to you. Those are very different marriages, very different love relationship directions. And Larry Crabb said that in many cases, unfortunately, the former situation, the end game of this, the, the end of the story is divorce, or either a very troubled marriage. In some cases, people accommodate, and in some cases, you know what, in this lifetime, People can kind of compromise. Maybe they're not quite as committed as before, but you know you, what, you still kind of do it for me, and so I'm gonna stick with you, because you still at least kind of do it for me, or I'm in this too long to get out of it because it would be too painful for me to leave, so even though you don't quite do it for me anymore, I'll stick with it. You have that range of marriages, or you have the kind of marriage in which each spouse is totally about the other one. Now, this has to do with marriages, but let's talk about the big marriage that is on the table before us from the Bible having to do with the love of God. And it's time for us today to reflect on what's been building up in this Gospel of Luke we've been reading on what your love's legacy is and will be, either death or life. Because you see, this is speaking about our relationship with God. Either we're going to be supposedly believing in God because of what God can do for us, get me out of hell and get me to heaven, or fix my marriage, or make me feel a little more spiritual, or help me be a better parent. Either we're using God for what we want. So in other words, our supposed faith in God is really about us, and our supposed love for God is really about us, okay? Or it's about God. This is built into the very core and depth of the Bible, not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament. The Old Testament centers in many ways around a, a passage or a series of passages of Scripture that are called the Shema. And for thousands of years, faithful Jews every morning and every night of every day they live, and your Lord and Messiah, Jesus, prayed this and recited this, Shema. 
Uh, the Shema includes passages of scripture from, if you're in my Sunday school class, we're working our way through Deuteronomy right now, so you already know this, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 to 21, remember the way we redouble around this, guys, and then also, of course, Numbers 15, 37 through 41. Kind of giving you a primer on Old Testament law before we turn to our scripture today, so I want you to be aware of this so you can pick up on some of the inflection points of Jesus' exchange with an expert in the law. Now, the, the Shema begins, uh, I hope you know this, so that the imperative form of the verb to hear is Shema, in other words, hear, listen, Shema Yisrael, Shema Israel, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, echad, or the Lord only. The Lord is one, the Lord only. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So this is talking about loving Israel's covenant God, the Lord. Israel doing this together. And then it's interesting because the Shema then focuses in on a collective singular you. You, Israel. Israel is commanded to love God, Israel's covenant redeeming Lord, with 100%, no compromise, 100% of your desires, thoughts, and will. You need to love God with everything, all your heart, okay? The way the Old Testament understands heart including your brain and your, your emotions and everything in between, okay? Love the Lord your God with all your spiritual and personal self, your soul. And love God, no compromise, 100% in, all in, with all your resources and all your capabilities. Now, over to the what would be called the second table of the Ten Commandments, we read a little summary that Jesus focused on. He was pretty powerful on this. It's from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. And the second half of that verse says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's like commandments five through 10, okay? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now the implication passage, and you could say, why are you giving me all this from the Old Testament pastor from the law? Well, I'm telling you, the, the, what we're gonna read about is about the law today, okay? So the implication passage is from Leviticus chapter 18, Verse 5, the Lord himself says, keep my statutes and rules. If a person does them, y'all see this? You're going to need to be aware of this. It's going to echo through our passage today. If a person does this, he shall, see that? Live, y'all see that? Live by them. Now last week, we looked at something we're going to open with with our scripture for today. Jesus' famous Trinitarian prayer from Luke chapter 10, Jesus in the joy of the Spirit, Jesus the Son exalts in the Father's sovereign rule and choice by his grace. You have hidden these things, Jesus says, from the learned and the wise and reveal them to little children. So in other words, God speaks to not the people who are so full of themselves and proud of themselves, but people who are before him like little children, okay? And you're going to need to catch this. Right after that, our key verse is going to lead into the probably second most famous parable that Jesus ever tells, the Good Samaritan. We're going to get this intro with Jesus talking to an expert in the law, and the way Luke puts it is, and behold. Okay? So in other words, after Jesus tells us the wise and the learned God doesn't reveal himself to, but he reveals himself to little children, here's our case in point. This is what Luke is telling us by the inspiration of God. We're supposed to really focus on what follows. Now, this Sunday, we're not going to dig into the Good Samaritan parable because it's really important for us as Christians and for you as you learn the Bible to understand there's a reason why these parables are placed where they are by the inspiration of God. And let me tell you, the two most famous parables of Jesus, the Good Samaritan and the most famous one, which would be what? The prodigal son. They're only in Luke. They're not in Matthew, Mark, or John. 
So that tells us we need to really pay attention where God inspired Luke to highlight them and where Jesus presented them. He may have presented them in other places, but the dynamic of what's going on when Jesus presents these parables. Okay, so we're supposed to pay attention. And behold, here's our case in point. Uh, now, let's read Luke chapter 10, verses 21 through 37. In that same hour, he, Jesus, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the learned and the wise and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and whomever the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples in private, he, Jesus said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wish to see the things you see, and they did not see them, and hear the things that you hear, and they did not hear them. And behold, here we go. And behold, an expert in the law stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Then he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He, Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly, This do, and you shall live. But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance... A priest was coming down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan, one who was journeying, came upon him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And going to him, he bound up his wounds after pouring on oil and wine on them. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I return when I come back. Now, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, uh, the one who did gracious, the act of mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. The reality is that everyone serves someone or something because everyone loves something or someone. A question we want to ask ourselves is, is my so-called love for so-called loved ones really about me? Do I love my kids or my grandkids because it's cool for me <laughs> or because I just love them, right? And then more deeply, is my supposed love of God really a love affair with myself and of what God can do for me or keep me out of or put into me or how proud I can be of myself because of my connection with God and my ability to manipulate God and my ability to show off about how much God loves me. 
Jesus said, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Now, this is a basic wisdom truth from Jesus. In this case, when he presents it, we read it in the Sermon on the Mount on, um, in, in Matthew chapter 6. He goes on and says, you cannot serve God and money. Your life and your life's love is either in the money or God. You can't have both. But this, is, this bifurcation is also true for uh, all kinds of other things, too. you got to choose. You know, you're going to go in one direction or another. You're going to love one or the other. So our question today, again, is what is my, what is your love's legacy? Is it death? Because if you're putting yourself and your love into yourself, you are going to die. Okay? You're going to be dust in the ground pretty soon. And what you try to produce is going to be, in the end, disaster. It's about you. Or is it life? You guys remember, y'all have read love stories or any kind of story before, right? At the end of the novel, what's there at the finale? What do you put in there? The what? The end. All stories are headed to an end. The Bible tells us we're all headed to an end. I'm just going to throw a whole lot of words at y'all today, but sorry, you don't have to learn all these, but I'm just giving... So this is, this is actually eschatology. The end, right? So eschaton in, in Greek means the end. So reality, everyone and every love will have a lasting legacy, and it's either going to be death or life. Eternal life, life in the age to come, is actually, if you want a real love story, I mean like a real love story, it's life in the age to come is all connected with the love story of the redeeming marriage. And the redeeming marriage is Christ and his bride. His bride is alternatively the church, New Jerusalem, New Israel in the Bible. So you want your story to be connected with that real prevailing love story. That's kind of going to answer the question, is your love's legacy death or life? Now, let's go back into our scripture for today. Luke chapter 10, verse 25, picking up on. And behold, we've already highlighted what's going on there. We're supposed to really pay attention to this. This is going to play off of what Jesus just stated. And I'll dig into that a little bit now. So an expert in the law stood up to put him to the test, saying... Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Zoe and Ionium. Now, he's asking a question about salvation, what in big words would be called soteriology. Soteriology is God's word on salvation. Dean said I should explain these terms to you, so I've, I've, I've sprinkled this in today again because we're getting an intersection of a bunch of different big theology words. This is the doctrine of the way we're rescued from sin and hell and eternal death to have or inherit eternal life. That's called salvation, soteriology. So in Greek, the word for savior is soter. And you know this word, kind of. Remember when Jesus the baby is born in Bethlehem? And the angel of the Lord in Luke chapter 2, verse 11 says, For unto you is born this day a what? Savior, Soter, and then he goes on and says, Christos Kurios. He combines three terms that are big terms, Savior, Christ, and Lord. Okay, He's all of these things wrapped up together, and that's kind of what we're hitting today. There's a whole lot of stuff wrapped up in how you respond to Jesus or not. Uh, how are people saved? This is a big question. You really need to know this, right? <laughs> this has to do with eternal destination. How am I saved? How was I saved? How will I be saved? How will others be saved that I'm worried about, that I'm praying for? Well, this guy, this expert, he's, a, he's an expert in the law. The term that Luke uses means he's like the highest level of expert in the law. He's a professor in biblical theology. In Old Testament, in Torah, the first five books of the Bible, this is where he hangs out 
and rabbinical teaching on the first five books of the Bible, as well as probably by extension the rest of the Old Testament. This is who this guy is. He's a professor. He's a big shot. He's very proud. He's very knowledgeable. He's very, you know, he teaches, right? And he says to Jesus, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let me ask you this. Do you think this guy is really worried about his salvation? Is he really coming to Jesus as a humble child? What do you all think? No, he's not. Okay, so the presenting question is okay in a sense. But again, as Luke says, behold, an expert in the law stood up. Now, this tells us that in this context, we got a bunch of people that are seated listening to Jesus' teaching. Okay, everybody's sitting down. We're supposed to remember that, I can tell you. Remember that because in a couple of weeks we'll get to Mary of Bethany and she is sitting at Jesus' feet. So she's going to be in contrast with this dude, this expert professor, who's going to stand up amid seated disciples and take on Jesus, probably take him down because this guy's tough. I mean, this guy really knows his stuff and he's here to question Jesus. He's here to put him to the test. Um, which brings up this issue of who do we have in the room? We have Jesus who is the Savior, who is what? Christ the Lord. So this is another term just for your information, Christology. That means the doctrine, God's word on who Jesus is, who the Christ is. And we've already been told, go back to last week's sermon. If you missed it, you can pull it up online with no other way. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me. You know, Jesus chooses to whom he will reveal himself and the Father to. And here at the basic way of the gospel theology is this. We begin with God's love. The Old Testament teaches us that as well as the New Testament. We begin with God's love. God's love leads to sovereign saving grace. Sovereign saving grace leads to God's revelation. So in other words, he speaks into the hearts of people, awakens them to who, who, who he is. And that leads to our knowing, and if we, we actually know God, we're gonna love God. If you say, I'm worried about do I really love God, let me tell you this, if you've actually been born again, if you actually know God, you're gonna be in love with him. You're gonna be totally about God. Don't worry about that. If you're saved, <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna be on fire to love God. And that then leads to, which again, this other thing is, well, I don't know how I'm going to produce. You will produce fruit, right? There will be faithfulness of the saved in active love of God and neighbor. That's just guaranteed. The Bible keeps saying that over and over again. Jesus does. And again, last week's sermon, we talked about no higher joy. Jesus rejoiced in the spirit because of all this and because of God's sovereign grace and the doctrine of special revelation. Yes, you're getting a primer on God's law and theology today. Sorry, but it's just all here. The doctrine of special revelation is what we're talking about. And Jesus exalts in this. This is the most exultant description of Jesus in the entire Gospels, in the entire New Testament. He's knocked out about this, that God is in charge of everything and that God chooses. And that God, just by total grace, saves people. You can be knocked out about this, too. It's awesome that God's in charge, like that God saves people. So... Um, let me pull back and tell you about God's election. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. It's probably apocryphal, but it's classic, right? Um, Lincoln, with his cabinet, meets, and there's, there's a vote. And Lincoln says at the end of it, seven nays and one eye. The eyes have it. Now, how did he come up with that, Matthew would say? And guess who voted I? Lincoln. The boss. This is on whether Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation or not. Everybody said this isn't a good time. You know, we need to get, like keep the coalition together. We need to keep all the different disparate political forces together. The polls aren't good for this one, Abe. And he says, I'm signing the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, speaking of setting people free, that's what God does. We don't vote on it. He doesn't read the polls. He does it. Divine sovereign election. You know, sovereignty and election are doctrines that say that God rules and God chooses salvation. I rejoice in that. If it's up to me and how good I am, I'm in big trouble. And honestly, sorry, I love you, but so are you. You really need God 
to be the I that overrides the nays. Because look at this, think of it. Is my faith in myself and what I can get into my head or what I can do out there, or is my faith in God who saves me? You've got to make that choice. The gospel invites you to believe that God is the one who saves you. And that's good news. It's really good news. All through the Bible, but just, for instance, Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says, Even as he, in other words, God the Father, chose us in him, in other words, Christ, before the foundation of the world. Isn't that awesome? Before the world was even created, God knew you, loved you, and chose you if you're a Christian, if you believe in him. I mean, that's something that lasts, right? This is before creation. God rules and chooses and gives salvation. So back to our guy, our professor, our proud dude, our wise guy. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, let's break this down, because he is asking a question, how can I be an heir of the kingdom to come? And what Jesus says, says is, look, you're going to have to know the Father if you're going to receive the inheritance, right? <laughs> yeah. But let's break down further, because this guy thinks he's so smart. Let's, let's start breaking him down a little bit. You don't get for yourself an inheritance, do you? How does the inheritance work? It is what? Given to you. Uh, also, notice the way this guy is totally focused on himself personally as opposed to what the Shema is written for, which is all Israel. He's not sitting there saying, boy, I hope Israel gets redeemed. I hope Israel comes to repentance, and maybe you're the Messiah, so maybe I should be open to you because I'm, I'm actually concerned about the total fulfillment of the covenant that is reflected in the Shema. So I'm a big picture person. I'm willing to think about somebody outside of myself. No, this guy's totally focused on himself. What do I need to do? Y'all see this? And this is an expert in the law, but he's totally selfish. What do I need to do to get my salvation? To get my inheritance? Along those lines, this guy's supposed to be an expert in the law, but you know in the law, if you know Deuteronomy, right? And you know, you, you know Exodus, Deuteronomy, right? Israel is the Lord's segalah, his treasured possession and his inheritance. He gives the promised land and the promises to his people, but they are, Israel is, his inheritance. That's the way the law is written. Inheritance language and treasure language is about God's inheritance in his people. And this guy's an expert in the law and he doesn't know that? Come on, give me a break, right? And it's definitely not about what's in it for me. So Jesus responds to this guy who clearly is not earnestly seeking <laughs> to be led by the master. He says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Which brings us to, you've got to understand Jesus. Jesus is a rabbi, okay? The old Jewish joke. Why does a rabbi answer a question with a question? What's the answer? Why shouldn't a rabbi answer a question with a question? <laughs> This is Jewish humor, right? So Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? In other words, how do you interpret it and recite it? And obviously the Shema is going to be central to this. And this guy gets, I mean, this guy's good. Like he says what Jesus is going to say elsewhere. He answered with Deuteronomy 6.5 and with Leviticus 19.18, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, this is where this guy has to decide, am I in a contest or am I seeking life and salvation? Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly this do, poei, and you will live. Say, say. He's totally, Jesus is connecting with the core where the rubber hits the road of the law in Leviticus Chapter 18, verse 5. Y'all remember it, right? Fill in the blanks. Keep my statutes, says the Lord. If a person does them, he shall what? Live by them. So Jesus teaches us that salvation and eternal life are not about spouting off the right answers. It's not about the best reciter in Sunday school class or whatever. It's about whether you actually love the Lord your God in real action and you love your neighbor in real action. 
As the New Testament says, James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We know this in standard, like sayings, right? What you preach, what? What goes in that blank? Practice. Practice what you preach. Where your money is, excuse me, where your mouth is, do what? Put your money there, right? Put your money where your mouth is. And Jesus, going back to this, says, this is in John chapter 15, you did not choose me, Christian, but I chose you. And why did I choose you? Just to make you happy? No. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Your fruit should abide, last, live. Which brings us back to this question, what's your legacy going to be? Your, your love affair. Is it with you or is it with God? Is it fruitful or not? In the Torah, God says, or Moses says on behalf of God, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death. There it is, life and death. Blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life. Jesus puts it this way in the New Testament. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who actually does. There's that verb link again. Oi own the will of my Father who is in heaven. So everyone who hears these words of mine and does or a them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock and it stands back to our expert in the law and jesus's response jesus says you have answered correctly this do and you will live now this guy now has an opportunity before him god has presented it to him he can either be humble and repent or he can try to show himself off and justify himself which way is he going to go which way do you go before the lord because we only get a few of these, right? These, this is like key junctures in life. Here he has an opportunity to seek the Lord and change his heart, that the Lord might change his heart. Remember Deuteronomy? It's about God's prevailing love. Deuteronomy says, God did not choose you, Israel, because you were better than the other nations or because you were righteous. God chose you because he loved you and set his love on you which calls then for the gospel. It's right there in the law. It's in Deuteronomy. We have to have our hearts circumcised. How am I going to circumcise my heart? Yeah, and how are you going to be born again? It's going to have to come from God, right? So Deuteronomy 10. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers, not on other people's, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. And then here's the key. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God, out of love for you, right, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, your children, so that you, this is how you're going to actually love the Lord in a saving way. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and you may live. This guy has it before him. He thinks he's an expert. He's just been shown by Jesus the entire Torah in a moment, and it's laid before him. What's he going to do? But desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In another situation, this is in John's Gospel, chapter 6, they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's it. Salvation centers in Jesus and the revelation of Jesus. All those ologies that I talked about, it's all coming together here. See, if we really love God in a Shema kind of love, in a New Testament kind of love, in a saving love, then we trust and focus on him, not ourselves. Where's your love? Where's your heart? Is it on yourself or is it on God? Not on my works, nor my manipulation of God, but on him and his grace. We love him, as 1 John says, because he first loved us, and we trust in that. We are his children. He is the saving father. This is the invitation that the lawyer had and that each one of us has as we move through life. This is the opportunity. 
come to Jesus. Lay yourself before him as a child and be lifted up in a love that will set you on fire. You will live in works and fruit that last forever because he is doing it through you, through a new heart that is for life, not for death, because it's all in for God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.